Good afternoon. We are going to start the session on learning analytics and assessment. And the first presentation is in charge of Catherine Thau from University Technology, Sydney. Hi, everyone. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to present you a case study of a MOOC that we developed at the University of New South Wales, Sydney in Australia. So I'm Catherine Zhao from this university. Um, basically, I'm going to present you two parts in this presentation. The first thing is the context. So we want to set the context right, that you understand what this MOOC is about, who designed the MOOCs, and how these decisions are made. And the second part is about the analytics and the visualization, which basically tells you uh, who these learners are and what they did. In order to answer our research questions, how we are going to develop a range of assessment tasks to help learners develop their critical thinking skills as health professional leaders. So when um, the university entered to the MOOC space a few years ago, we perceived MOOCs as a experimental field. What that means is their faculties proposed um, their ideas of developing a particular course on Coursera and somebody from the central PVC education will work with these um, academics in developing these MOOCs. And what I'm showing you here is the focus of our presentation today is health leadership. In a broad sense, um, this is the pedagogical module that we are experimenting. So in each of the MOOCs that we developed, we make decisions based on the domain topics. Um, the teacher's preferred way of convening the course and also their experiences of how students in this domain may learn in such a context. And therefore, what you are looking at here is the course design. It refers to um, how the content is released. For health leadership, the contents were released at the beginning of the course. And course delivery refers to how this course is taught. So. Um, instead of telling people at the beginning of each week that we are going to learn this particular topic, we have the course instructors coming in at the beginning and say, so these are the contents you are able to self-direct your learning. And as you can see, there are other combinations of these pedagogical models and they each were designed for a particular purpose and that purpose is to achieve their intended learning outcomes. So next, I would like you to uh, meet the other authors of this MOOC, and also the purpose is to give you a real sense of what health leadership is about and what in this course we touched upon to enable people to develop their critical thinking skills as health leaders. UNSW, Australia. Healthcare is one of the most, if not the most, complex, high-stakes industries in the world. Regardless of your setting, leaders in healthcare share similar challenges around the world. These include resource constraints, changes in patient demographics, increases in people living with chronic and complex diseases, ensuring the quality and the safety of care, and workforce shortages. Health leadership is an integral part of addressing all of these challenges. Hello, I'm Dr. Leslie Halliday. I'm Julia Kennedy. And I'm Associate Professor Joanne Travaglia, and we're part of the health management team in the Faculty of Medicine, UNSW Australia. In this course, we'll explore health leadership from a personal, team and organisational perspective. You'll engage with a combination of learning activities, including quizzes, reflection and discussion, You'll hear from health leaders and experts across different healthcare settings and specialties, and you'll develop a new, broader perspective on health leadership. We're really excited to be part of this innovative program and hope you will join us in this journey to develop your health leadership skills. Okay, so I'll leave there. Uh, I hope this video gives you a sense of how complex health professionals could be facing in the situations and oops, what did I just do? Huh? Okay. 
And the focus um, of our work is that we identified, basically we, we are interested in two essential questions. The first thing is, um, is our design work, did we help people develop their critical thinking skills in this course? And the second thing is, is our pedagogical working, our model working? And at the same time, we also identified two trends in the MOOC's development. The first thing is we realized that it's becoming more micro-crediting. So there are universities that start to develop MOOCs that count towards a degree program. So all of a sudden, learning in MOOCs count. And you've got to be thinking, well, uh, we got to quality assure the learning outcomes. And that relates to assessment task. And we intend is to use assessment tasks to quality assure learning outcomes. And the second thing is we begin to see more organizations and employers uh, recognize their MOOC certificate and counted it as a part of their professional development. So in a sense, so in a sense we based um, this context and um, come up with our two assertions. The first thing is that we assume that traditional educational methods work in this um, context. At least we can give it a try. And the second thing is we believe assessment tasks, if designed carefully, it can also help learners in this regard to develop their critical thinking skills. So what do we mean by critical thinking skills in this particular MOOC? Well, the first thing is, as you've just watched the video, um, if you are a learner of this MOOC, you'll be put into a highly complex and often controversial setting. What that means is that you will be in a situation that you need to make decisions at a personal, team, and organizational level. And the content expert here identify four domains for you to map against your current status, and you are able to develop a personal plan towards the end of the course through a range of assessment tasks. And we will have a look at how we actually did that. So at the beginning, you will be given these assessment rubrics, which tells you how you are going to be measured against um, in terms of your leadership skills. And you also have quizzes in most of the weeks that you are able to make decisions by selecting the choices as uh, multiple choices questions. Now the next thing is um, self-assessment task. Self-assessment task was recommended to submit in week two, and it basically gives you an opportunity to uh, identify your current uh, leadership skill status. And towards the end, you have peer assessment task, where you can come up with a plan and you'll be given it to a peer that will give you the feedback and evaluation to help you to go forward. So this is a basically how the range of assessment tasks were designed to help learners to equip um, their leadership skills. Now the next thing is the, is the second part of uh, the presentation is the analytics. So there are two key points we would like to present you today. The first thing is who these learners are, and the second thing is what they did, to give you a broad sense of what just happened in this course before we go into rigorous statistical and modeling. So um, we have more than 60 uh, thousand people expressed their interest by clicking on the enroll button. And when the course actually started, we have around 4,000 people who were active. Now, active learner here refers to the very commonly used uh, term in Coursera MOOC research community. That means if you at least turn up once in the course when it was uh, offering periods that you are considered active, right? So we have about 4,000 people that actually uh, at least turn up once. 
completing, we have around 600 people completing the course. That means they passed the 50% grade. <coughs> and we have about 261 people who actually got their MOOC certificate. And also we have other um, demographics of these people. So for example, um, their average age is 38. Above 70% of them have already got a bachelor degree or above. Gender ratio around one to one and about 30% of them identify themselves as a health professionals to give you an idea who they are. Now the next thing is we want to look at so what how people engaged in this course with the different types of course contents and usually the first thing we start with is to look at how they use their um, video materials. So what it shows here is a heat map of their overall video usage. So when I say overall, I really mean, so other than the lecture videos, we also have the Q&A videos and other different types of interviews with their leaders and that sort of thing. So um, obviously you have um, uh, week one all the way to week seven, that's the uh, total duration of the course offering period and also uh, on why you have the different modules. The bigger the square, that means the higher the usage is. So immediately what you're looking at here is a diagonal line that with all the bigger squares lining up there, indicating while well, actually people follow or people use their video materials on a weekly basis. So um, to give you a sense of the size of the square, the biggest one is uh, in week one, module one, and that's above 50%, okay? So that message comes out quite clearly. Now the interesting thing is when we look at the submission, the assessment submission patterns, we observe some uh, different uh, differences. Um, what you're looking at here is also a very simple frequency count but we convert it into a percentage so that you can compare the submissions, the proportion of the submissions uh, across a range of these tasks. So from week one to week seven, and at the bottom all the way up to the yellow band, what you're looking at are the quizzes submissions. And it's very um, interesting that you will be able to see the biggest portion happens in the corresponding week. So for example, quiz one, the biggest proportion happens in week one, and quiz two, week two, quiz three, week three, and quiz five, week five. The interesting thing is uh, at the top. So if you look at the blue band, that is the submission pattern of the uh, self-assessment task. We do not see the biggest proportion happened in week two, although it was recommended by the course instructor to submit it in week two. But people seem to take their pace and they, we roughly have around 20% of them submitting the self-assessment task in, uh, throughout the weeks. So uh, that comes out quite clearly and it got us to start thinking, well, people probably is making decisions and the interesting thing for us to explore is to how and why. Um, so the next thing is we obviously want to demonstrate whether there is a increase of people's uh, leadership skills by doing this course. So what I'm showing here is their responses in their self-assessment uh, task. Um, so when you are, if you are a learner of the MOOC and you will be given this task at week two, and what you will be doing is that you give yourself a rating across these four domains of the uh, abilities. What we identify here is very interestingly in domain one, two, and three, you have a lot more abilities uh, identified as um, competent or advanced. You will be able to see that through the mean rating and the standard deviation. And a lot less in terms of the number of abilities are identified as developing. So what happens in domain four is that we, identi we, we uh, realize a lot of people um, actually identify their abilities in this domain as less developed. So um, 
we cannot jump to conclusion, but we start to see the evidence telling us people are putting in genuine efforts in self-assessing their abilities at the early point of the course. So um, the next thing is um, we are showing you these uh, feedbacks on peer assessment. And as you can see, the number dropped a little bit, but uh, the good news is uh, these 500 people basically <laughs> all submitted their self-assessment task. So if you submitted a self uh, you submitted a peer assessment, you will also have the uh, opportunity to evaluate someone else's work. So this is the feedback that basically telling you what people who's, uh, who submitted work also evaluated and <coughs> provided feedback to others. So um, it's quite clear to us that um, above 50% of these um, ratings and the categories picked by the evaluators indicates uh, a lot of these learners have actually identified their leadership competencies and they were able to generate or come up with a plan in which they identify steps and actions that will help them to further develop their leadership skills. And we see so much less Okay, so much less um, frequencies at the bottom that say poor planning or no abilities identified. So that's the preliminary findings. <clears throat> so this is the last slide I'm going to show you. Um, when you have a look at these preliminary findings and you will start to think about, well, how do you know uh, they are health professionals or not? So we started to put people into buckets and then we run all sort of analysis to see whether there are some sort of a differences we can identify. And this is the first step. So what we did here is to basically map people's first day and last day in the course. First day means the first time they turn up in the course, last day, the last time they turn up in the course. What we are seeing here is something um, quite interesting. So non-health professionals are blue and health professionals are orange. If you wide open your eyes, you will be able to see all the orange dots are actually lining up towards this end and that's the beginning of the course. And they are a little bit upwards, that means towards the end of the course. And what it shows you is that they intended to come to the course early and they intended to leave the course late. We cannot jump to conclusion and say uh, they stayed with the course, but in a sense that it, you can come up with more hypotheses and say they are more committed throughout their learning. And what's also important is uh, the linear regression model shows a significance in predicting their last day so that's um, for the non-health professionals, the p-value is actually so much less than 0.01. Uh, and that means it's significantly, the first day significant, uh, significantly predicts their last day. And for the health professionals, uh, the p-value is greater than 0.05 and it means it doesn't predict. What that means, in other words, is that for health professionals and they are more likely to stay with the course. Um, and that's the size of the demographic survey that we use to come up with this kind of a hypothesis. Uh, margin of error equals to 2.3 and we are reasonably happy because uh, that tells us the subset uh, basically represents uh, the whole uh, population. So that's the first step, it's not conclusive and we have a lot more work to do. Um, and these are the initial findings. So I believe I am on time. Hi? Okay, so I'm open to questions. These are the findings as you can read, but I would like to take some questions. Thank you, Karin. Questions, please? Um, 
I don't know if I've seen this correctly, but in your heat map, it seemed that some learners actually did module six in week one, is that correct? And if so, does that mean they did the whole course in one week? Um, yeah, there are some learners who actually stayed in the course within one day, and they did everything. What the average time commitment you would expect for this course? Um, I guess it really depends on their status of their students. So if they are working professionals, we expect them to spend uh, four to five hours every week to go through all the materials. But if they, for example, if they are students or somebody that is looking for jobs, they probably might just uh, finish the course within one day. So there are some parameters that are uh, shaped into that behavior. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I don't understand what is the difference between uh, 600 people who are completing, so they have got, um, they obtain more than 60%, and the 200 people who will be certified. What is the difference between them? Um, so you're you're referring to the completing and the certified cohort? Is that your question? In your size, you tell, uh, you tell us uh, we have got 600 people yes. who complete the course. Yes. So they have done more <coughs> than 60% uh, of, of the results. But there, there are only 2,000 people who are certified. I yeah, two, 261 that were certified. So um, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly, but uh, People can obviously pass the course without pursuing a certifi uh, certificate. Yeah. More questions? Okay, Evelyn, thank you very much. Eamon Costello uh, from Dublin City University will make the, the next presentation. Thank you. Hi. So I'm going to talk about MOOC friends and followers analysis of Twitter hashtag networks. And that's me. And I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues from Dublin City University at the National Institute for Digital Learning. So uh, because this is about Twitter, please tweet <laughs> and use this hashtag. Uh, but please use this one as well, because this is what the, this talk is going to be about a bit. And also because having someone just talk at you for 30 minutes is very boring, and research indicates that lectures are terrible. So don't listen to me. Be on your phone, tweet, do something else. Uh, so what do people say about MOOCs on Twitter? They say things like this, and this, and this. They say lots of different things, it's different stakeholders. So as I said, I'm from Dublin City University the National Institute for Digital Learning, and we have a, a MOOC research group. We have some MOOCs coming out in FutureLearn this year on the Irish language and social media marketing, and this is a MOOC that we presented on earlier about transitioning learners to higher education, to flexible study, and including refugees, and that, that is in the conference proceedings as well if you're interested in transitioning students to higher education online learning. So. This, we conducted this research on MOOCs in the media and what uh, print media is saying about MOOCs and who is setting the agenda about MOOCs and is it uh, the established order and the big universities marketing their courses or is it truly enabling access and who's controlling the narrative? So we, this, we 
uh, established a project in collaboration with the Irish Centre for Cloud Computing and Beijing Normal University to look at MOOCs in Twitter. So everybody here is familiar with the word MOOC, but not everybody is. So uh, this shows that only a small number of uh, educators are familiar with the term MOOC. And then if you talk to, oh sorry, that was uh, a, sur this is an EDUCAUSE survey of student and faculty. And this one um, shows that 74% of students don't know what a MOOC is, that term MOOC. 17% know what it is but haven't taken one. 9% have taken MOOC and 5% have successfully completed one. Those rates not really, but they could be lying. But uh, So that's just something to bear in mind. And so what we, the first thing we did was to find out uh, what is already known about this um, topic. So we did a systematic literature review and we followed two reviews, systematic reviews of Twitter and MOOCs. Uh, we did some searches uh, for MOOCs and microblogging using these databases and we found, uh, we used an exclusion inclusion criteria, empirical results of primary data published in a peer-reviewed journal of conference proceedings between January uh, 2012 and 2016, written in English, with 33 eligible articles, and a summary of, of what was in those is um, there's, the studies are relatively small in terms of big data research with Twitter. Some research has analyzed three and a half billion tweets, for example, in analyzing uh, what people are saying about adverse drug effects was a famous study, but whoops. Uh, but the maximum is, is a quarter of a million, over a quarter of a million learners and 12 million tweets, but the median there is uh, just under 3,000. Uh, some articles of note, this one is about uh, a well-cited article about MOOCs in, in, a, in a, a Twitter, in a, about Twitter use amongst MOOC learners. Um, <coughs> OER versus MOOCs, hashtag MOOC versus OER, sentiment analysis. And this study is very interesting. It's a, a study of hashtag MOOC in Sinai Weibo, the Chinese microblogging platform. And they found some interesting uh, findings about traces of uh, uh, what time people study at and so on, according to MOOCs. Although this study and some others, like this one, which analyzed 800,000 tweets with the term MOOC, sometimes I think are guilty of conflating the term MOOC with a learner or a course, because as we've seen, not all learners know what the term MOOC is, so they're not necessarily using it. And uh, this recent study um, looked at specific course hashtags. So this study, I'm using a combine harvester here for this image because, uh, oops, this study here, Beyond the MOOC platform, gaining insights about learners from the social web, analyzed 12 million tweets, 12 million individuals rather, and it linked data from edX, LinkedIn, Twitter, Gravatar, and GitHub together. So some ethical issues in this one. A stack Exchange, and they inferred the gender and age of these people. So we uh, we we. Our project analyzed a year long worth of data, but we started with four months worth. And we used the Twitter streaming API, which we have access to through agreement with Twitter. And it's expensive to do, so you have to pay every time you download the data, but you get a really good, robust uh, uh, data source. Um, and we analyzed it using big data techniques. And uh, you need cloud infrastructure. You can't just download it all into a spreadsheet. And what we found was the first thing we did some content analytics, and this is a paper we published on that at Askalite last year. And we looked at the top words that people use when they use the hashtag MOOC on Twitter. Um, and we looked at the top hashtags. And we looked at the peak tweets. So we used peak detection algorithms to see what tweets were uh, caused a, a huge uh, spike in uh, Twitter traffic in this network. And some of, a lot of these are promotional tweets for courses. In fact, most of them are. 
Um, and this one is uh, kind of a spam tweet. Uh, we conducted sentiment analysis. There's average degree of sentiment in, in the tweets. Uh, but this is interesting. This is an example of some exemplar tweets with high degree of sentiment because you might have noticed from the last slide about those promotional tweets, which do get a lot of traction. They're low on sentiment. They're just factual. This course is starting. But these ones are, uh, are sentiment high or low. They're things about they're often correlated with learners. So all of these, apart from this one here, are learners. And this one here is somebody, uh, an education technologist, if you like. So if you take the ed tech community, it's somebody talking about research in MOOCs. So it's people like us. Um, and actually, it shows you some of the dangers of sentiment analysis, that it's a bit fuzzy. You always get some false positives. And this it isn't really a negative tweet as such. It's not as negative as it seems. Um, so we so there's different ways of conceptualizing a network. And this is a very good book on this topic, uh, Metrics for Understanding Communications on Twitter. And the authors of this book talk about enunciative, you say something. Uh, conversational, you reply to somebody, or disseminate if you retweet somebody. So there's three basic forms. Um, and then researchers have used this to talk about networks being either informational or social. So you might have an informational network, you go onto Twitter and you just follow somebody and you read them and you never actually put anything in yourself or you never reply to somebody. So there's different ways of conceiving of what, what a network might be. It's how, how are people connected together. So we analyze the network according to, in two different ways. One, uh, based on uh, follows. So I follow you, therefore we're connected together in a network. And another one based on replies. So I reply to you, therefore we're in a network. And in this uh, follow based, there's few examples of this fr in, from, the, the, it, from the literature out there of comparing both types of, of network. Uh, and this is the key uh, between the centrality is a measure of how connected you are in the network. If basically, if you take somebody out, lots of other nodes will go down. So they would lose a connection with each other. And between the centrality for MOOCs 24 is a is, is the highest here. Nutrition MOOCs, if you're running a MOOC and you ever want to see how to promote it, look at, look at what these guys are doing because they keep coming up as very uh, highly <coughs> ranked the way they promote their, their MOOC. Um, similarly, and you can see most of these are platforms or people that are part of the MOOC economy. So what we have now is a kind of a MOOC economy and any sufficiently sophisticated market, you're going to get people that are simply very specialized and doing things like MOOC News or Class Central is, is a classic example. They're, they're part of this new MOOC economy that you have of the long tail of the MOOC economy, EU MOOCs, MOOCs 24. Uh, some of these are individuals, and a lot of them are platforms. Um, so thank you. And these are based on replies. This is the network based on replies, and you can see much more of these are, are individuals. This one here is a course. That's again, that was a very, very well marketed course, new, new social marketing. Um, and edX is obviously a big, we did use the Blondell algorithm to use community detection as well. And edX online is one of the biggest, um, one of the, the most highly influential people in the network. And you can see a lot of these as well are people in the educational technology. Yishe and Darko is here at the conference, and Diana Adon, people like that. So they're, uh, and some of them are, are MOOC instructors. So we further classify these according to whether people are instructors or they're commentators or learners. But learners are not, if you're looking for learners, it, the sentiment seems to be the place to, to get them and specific strings as well, like I completed this course or whatever. So the next, our further research from this is we did, we analyzed the year long data and we're classifying uh, the users according to uh, the tweeters, according to what they are, how they fall into these categories. And um, <coughs> I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eamon. Questions, please.
Hello, I'm Mar Pérez from the Pontificia Universidad Católica, Chile. Um, thank you for your presentation. It looks as inter interesting big data analysis I've seen. But I would like to know a little bit more about what is the point of your exploration here. So are you looking for uh, knowing what is happening around MOOCs in the Twitter online? Are you trying to distinguish between learners or influence people or leaders? Because, uh, I mean, how can we uh, get, get this data and apply it to our situations, for example? Will it be useful for me to know whether if I put this word there, it's going to look for? So I guess we're, it's exploratory research at this stage. We're, we're just uh, at this phase of it. We're looking at different questions. But some of it relates, touched on a couple of things you said. Uh, how do you find influencers in a network? Who are the important influencers in particular networks of courses? How would you uh, possibly cultivate those or, or reach out to those? Or if you're an instructor of a course or a course provider, what are good patterns and ways you can uh, interact with learners? Or how would you get data on learners? How would you look for that data? What would a learner look like in a, in a big, messy data set? I, as as an instructor, I see that this might be this possibility of what is happening with your participants is very interesting. But I'm wondering if you are looking at because the, at particular tweeters from a particular MOOC. Because so, yeah, it's a good question. So we have another data set where we've got 50 hashtags of we started trying to get the biggest MOOCs that uh, by enrollment using the I think it's I don't think it's it might be from Class Central. Um, and uh, we, we, not all courses have hashtags, which is very interesting. And only one of the platforms, FutureLearn, have a hashtag format. So it's FL something something. And a lot of the platforms have a built-in thing when you get a certificate and when you do this, that, or the other. So, but it's surprising how few of the courses have a proper hashtag. Now, it may be like you're putting a lot onto an instructor or a course team if you're asking them after they've shoot this challenge of <laughs> educating 3,000 people in the, in the MOOC itself to be, have this other digital uh, social media strategy. But there's definitely some, some key things that can be done to, to help promote and possibly the learners as well. There is uh, some evidence of some learning going on and some uh, social network building for students. Okay, thank you very much. What is his name? I say Saliha Sunar uh, from uh, Yildiz Technical University from Turkey. We'll make the, the next presentation. And yes. uh, also, uh, Ismail Duru. Yes, okay. but she is from Southampton and from Yugoslavia. Oh. <laughs> I, I would like to explain it. <laughs> she, she, she is from Southampton University. Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Slides, how how am we get it? Oh, this is okay. Sorry. Um, welcome to our presentation. Uh, we are going to give a speech about second language English speakers in MOOCs. Um, me and my colleague from, uh, Ismail from Istanbul uh, is going to do this presentation. I am uh, Aisha from the University of Southampton. Uh, I am in my final year of my PhD and I am interested in the importance of the social perspective of MOOCs. And Ismail is doing his PhD as well in learning analytics and MOOC, and he is particularly interested in the second language English speakers, how they um, behave in uh, MOOCs in their um, in a language. Uh, it's different from their uh, mother language. 
And those are the other authors. Unfortunately, Dr. Gillespie couldn't make it today. She is, she is attending another conference, and Dr. C is uh, here with us. Um, I would like to give some statistics about um, provided languages by MOOCs. Uh, in 2014, 80% of the MOOCs were English, and uh, the rate decreased to 75% in 2015. And there are some uh, local providers like X in China and X in Spanish, and there are many other uh, local providers they are providing MOOCs in different languages. Also, uh, the main city MOOC providers are based on English-speaking countries. Those are just three examples. Uh, Coursera from the US, FutureLearn from the UK. Even though the majority of the courses uh, they are providing are in English, they also provide some courses in uh, different languages. Um, about the deficiency of MOOCs, um, even though there are local MOOC providers, or um, there, there are, you know, same MOOC have uh, two different versions, one in English, one in another language, uh, English, second language English speakers still pay attention to MOOCs are offered in English. But um, some of them declared some difficulties. They are struggling to understand the spoken language in the video, or some <laughs> phrases, or sometimes accent of the instructor. And uh, they also sometimes feel shy to join the conversation. So they just keep watching and spend a lot of time to understand the video. And uh, MOOC platforms are trying to address this issue. And um, even though they, do, they usually don't provide any um, wide wide uh, personalization services, but for example, Coursera asked their um, attendees to voluntarily translate the content. And uh, this is a screenshot from a future learn. And future learn and other uh, platforms usually provide subtitles or um, slow playback motion or, uh, for example, here you can see transcripts. Sometimes transcripts are in different languages. Uh, our general objective of our research is identifying the common uh, patterns of second language English speakers uh, in an English MOOC. And we would like to identify um, what is the you know, most typical behavior of second language users. Is there any difference between first language users and them? And at the end, we would like to predict their future participation and certification earn. We also would like to recommend them some strategies to study with MOOCs so they could benefit from more. Um, we are in the very early stage of the, this research, and that's why this presentation will only focus on who are these English speaking learners, uh, second language English speaking learners, and how to uh, detect them. And Ismail is going to take over the presentation from you. And thank you. Uh, hello, as, as Aisha told, uh, I will uh, summarize the presentation uh, for our article. Uh, in our study uh, for this article, we were uh, trying to identify uh, who, who are the second language English speakers and uh, how we can identify uh, them. I think our study uh, can uh, contribute uh, to any of uh, MOOC providers uh, from countries uh, which in which English is a second language. Uh, and also, uh, we also think they, they can help uh, to MOOC providers to uh, find best and accurate strategies uh, for English as a second language users. And uh, this is a lecture which uh, we used in our study to uh, ident identify uh, English as a second language users. Uh, we used this lecture because, as you see, it's a language-oriented uh, lectures. It's named uh, Understanding Language for Learning and Teaching. And we used four uh, 
ed education in our study uh, it uh, it uh, run run uh, the previous year 2016 and its content provided by uh, collaboration uh, uh, University of Southampton and British uh, Council. And this picture from uh, our MOOCs and as you see, uh, it includes four weeks and it, in every week uh, there are some uh, steps. Uh, and the next slide uh, sh uh, show, show us, shows us that uh, in every step and in every week, uh, em a uh, form is integrated to uh, FutureLearn uh, platform. Uh, user, uh, so user can uh, inter interactively use this platform and uh, inter uh, interact with uh, each other. And also, uh, social media features like uh, comment, uh, reply, and follow uh, also integrated to this platform. Uh, so it is easy to. Uh, an, uh, analyze them for us and user uh, can mark as a complaint when uh, they com uh, complete a step in in the future learn platform uh, we use three basic data uh, data files in our study uh, which are enrollment step activity and comments we use enrollments to identify users uh, demographic informations and uh, if they drop out or they got certificate and also we used uh, step activity uh, to understand when they start a act an activity or when they finished and lastly, we use comments datasets. Data uh, it uh, has has inform infor, informations uh, information like uh, uh, comment text, uh, who, who name of the commenter, and uh, commenting time. Uh, in this paper, uh, we completed three three steps, uh, and uh, in each steps we. Uh, uh, revise our gr grouping. Uh, in first step, uh, we grouped uh, them as a two cate category: English as a second uh, language users and English as a first uh, language users. But uh, the results uh, were result wasn't uh, like we expected to be. Uh, so we uh, decided to update uh, our grouping based on their uh, learners' lo location. So uh, we d divided uh, English as a first language users to two subgroups, uh, as a first uh, and primary language and first but not primary language users. So uh, after that, we uh, I will show you in the d detail of our study, but this is just an overview. Uh, and after that, lastly, we uh, also uh, uh, looked uh, comment of learners to improve our grouping. Uh, in our uh, first step, as I told you, uh, we uh, had a, a two basic uh, learner group, English as a second language and English as a first language users. Uh, in our lectures of the course, uh, there were nearly uh, 25,000 users, but only 3,000 uh, of them had a uh, country information. So uh, in our study, we used only 3,000 of them. We filtered the data. And uh, how we uh, decide, understand uh, what are the, uh, who are English as a second and English as a first language or primary language, uh, we used two Wikipedia article to decide uh, them. As you see, uh, this is the first uh, article, and uh, this article show, shows us uh, who, who are the English as a uh, f second, uh, who are English as official users, and also uh, <coughs> it includes both official and primary and official, uh, but not primary users. And this is the second article, and uh, we uh, needed to use this because in, in our data set, uh, the name of uh, the uh, countries uh, 
names of the country wasn't weren't uh, included. So we used uh, this page to convert them uh, in our analysis. Uh, as you see, uh, country calls uh, G GB for uh, United Kingdom. And this is the uh, general distribution uh, distribution for uh, in a, for our first step. Uh, only 13% uh, of uh, users ha uh, has a has count country information, and 4% of uh, them uh, first uh, language users. 9% uh, of uh, them. Uh, uh, second language users uh, and others uh, that don't doesn't have uh, any country information. Uh, the, as uh, the result of first step uh, was that uh, there weren't uh, any sign 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 significant differences between uh, the groups. Uh, so we uh, needed to update our uh, grouping method. Uh, how we revise, how we update our uh, grouping. Uh, we uh, used the, uh, why we need it actually. Uh, in our previous grouping method, uh, United Kingdom and India were, uh, were in the same group. But as you know, uh, in United Kingdom, many people uh, in English as a uh, first and primary, but in India, uh, it's, it's also of official language, but not uh, primary language. So uh, this, we improved a number, uh, we increased a number of our group to three as a English as a first and primary language. English uh, first is English as a first and primary. Second English is first, not uh, and but not primary. And third English is a second language users. And the distribution in the second step. Uh, uh, when we uh, investigated the distribution, 18% uh, of them was uh, uh, English as a uh, first and primary language users like uh, UK, and 11% uh, of them uh, were, were uh, English is an official but not primary language user like India, and uh, nearly 17% per of them uh, were uh, English not as a second language users like Turkey, and uh, when we uh, investigated how uh, how they used uh, the MOOC platforms, uh, how they were active, uh, we we uh, we saw that uh, uh, English as a uh, first and primary language users were most uh, active user groups. Uh, as you see, uh, the third one, the black one, show uh, show users uh, which completed 18 percent, more than 18 uh, percent of all activities, and it is uh, it is highest in English as a official and primary uh, language, and there is a big difference between groups. And we also uh, investigated the, their formal activities uh, to understand uh, the differences between uh, their uh, so, so social features. And the first result was uh, in interesting for us because uh, there uh, weren't many significant differences uh, with, the num uh, with the number of their contribution. Uh, they were nearly equal to each other. But when we checked uh, length of their comments, uh, uh, we, we have seen that uh, there were uh, uh, a significant difference uh, as, uh, beca because of English as a first uh, language users uh, has a high, ha uh, ha higher comments, but the other groups were still uh, similar to each other. So what was the result of uh, our step? Two, uh, it uh, there still uh, wasn't uh, there wasn't any big differences between uh, groups, but uh, uh, a couple of significant differences, like uh, English as a pr official and primary users wrote uh, longer comments, uh, has exist. So uh, we 
we understand that uh, we understand that there is still need for update uh, to understand uh, differences between group or uh, correct grouping. So we uh, decided to check uh, their comments, and in uh, in the lecture uh, we, which we used. Uh, in step 1.5, uh, they ask users uh, their uh, location and they f uh, ask questions, a question, uh, ask users a question to learn uh, uh, where are they from and uh, what what are their first language and are they fluent in English. Uh, so we use them to understand if uh, our previous grouping methods were correct, and this uh, table uh, show uh, what uh, what was the correctness of uh, our previous two steps. Uh, as you see, in, uh, six, uh, 68 of the records uh, of uh, nearly 700 uh, were. Uh, grouped uh, wrongly in our previous two, two step. Uh, so uh, we we understood that comments are also uh, important uh, uh, fact, fact, fact uh, important to understand uh, to, to and uh, group them correctly. And I also uh, want to show you uh, a last uh, statistics uh, which uh, shows us. Uh, step activity compl uh, completion for uh, participant uh, uh, which uh, com commented in step 1.5. Uh, as you see, uh, number of uh, activity uh, increased in uh, both three, three group because of uh, their. Uh, we, we think it's because of uh, their. Uh, so the, the, they are being uh, users which are socially active and uh, contributing to forums. So uh, the challenge which we uh, for, uh, which we uh, which we uh, uh, now we fo fo focus on, uh, we wanted to uh, understand uh, all of the uh, users. Uh, which are English as a second or first language users, or they are primary or my primary. So there is a need to uh, check all co comments, and it is not uh, easy to and possible to check them manually. So uh, we uh, we decided to use a natural la language pr processing method, but it is uh, not completed or just uh, at the begin in the beginning and we also think about using graph analysis to uh, and, uh, to group or uh, to group better uh, we want to use it uh, in our fo fo in their follow interaction and also comment and re reply interactions and you can uh, reach uh, uh, this is link of our uh, papers and you can uh, use it to reach it. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any question, we can answer. Can you say, uh, is my, thank you very much. Question, please. Uh, thank you for your wonderful uh, couple presentation. I, uh, I enjoyed it. I was wondering, uh, you took um, teaching English or teaching languages as yes. the MOOC where you uh, build your research around. And um, I was wondering if the people taking that MOOC are just a little bit better in languages because I was kind of surprised of the, the small differences that you find between uh, native speakers and non-native speakers, to say it really quickly. And then also I wanted to know, in, in combination with that, I wanted to know how did you select um, the learners, how did you know they were, um, they had, they were native speakers or non-native speakers? Uh, uh, in the dat data file enrollments, uh, they have uh, an information like country code, so we used it, and to understand uh, what it refers, we used two Wikipedia article in first 
uh, as uh, in first article I will show Uh, this is the first article which show, uh, shows cunt, uh, which country uh, in which country English is an official language and also English as an official uh, primary or not primary uh, the countries uh, out of uh, which uh, doesn't exist in in this uh, article we, uh, we accept th uh, them as a not official or second language users so if you are an English teacher from Britain and you're teaching in let's say Saudi Arabia you're considered uh, Saudi actually we plan to because uh, that kind of that kind of maybe puts a little bit um, we first use their location information so we assumed if you are from UK you are English speaking native English speaking so in order to update this information, we look their comments. If they say, yeah, I live in the UK, but I am from France. So we, start, we then change their group. But we need to look at all the comments, so we are going to do it. But that step 1.5 was um, asking people, where are you from? You know, how are you using English in the, your daily language? So that's why that, comment, that step we used. For the first question, um, we choose this book because uh, it was a teaching, you know, uh, focused on teaching English. So the targeted learners were actually English teachers in um, different countries, rather than Engl England and the US. So um, yes, they are a bit better in uh, English, but mm, because it, um, the demography of the learners are quite wide, they were literally all over the world. So that's why we chose this. Mm -hmm. Anisha Bakaria from UQX here. Um, just in terms of uh, identifying uh, second language learners, um, there was a paper in 2016 at the Learning at Scale conference where they were referring to a different metric for identifying um, second language learners. And their idea was to use a setting in the browser mm -hmm. where they identify as uh, what's your preferred language. So probably just a suggestion I don't think that's actually tracked in any of the MOOC logs in the mm -hmm. user agent string, but certainly with some JavaScript you could um, track that and store that yourself. Yes, um, I forgot the author's name, but the very paper they were um, collecting the browsers and you know their language preferences from the browsers. So it is kind of an assumption if you are using English, you are native, but. Um, we are actually the main goal, you know, the, uh, f in the future. We want to identify them they, from their behavior pattern. If they are English second language or first language users, without knowing their country or you know language preferences, without asking them, that's the you know uh, future objective of our research. So so far, we are just doing um, behavior analysis. Thank you. Very interesting research. <coughs> More question? Is this a future learn MOOC? Yes. Um, so as far as I understand, when you log in or when you register to FutureLearn, you <coughs> need to fill in a kind of a user profile. There you have a question that asks you whether English is your first speaking English. So is it possible that you can map these data sets to your uh, learner profile that you can understand whether they are first yeah. um, the native language. Thank you. First of all, it is not compulsory to answer for them. So we also collected the country information from their answers. So some of them didn't answer it. And also, I am not sure if they are asking if they, English is their first language right now, but in our data set, this information wasn't inf um, included. Only country information was available. Yeah, they, they don't ask. They only ask where are you, f you know, um, where are you joining from the course. So, only country information is available. But we can, you know, we can map it. But still, uh, the country information doesn't approve their first language. We need more analysis. Mm -hmm. That. 
That's quite interesting because we are also with um, FutureLearn as well, and mm. from the user profiles, we are able to see whether they identify English as their first speaking country. So I'm not sure if that's a standardized uh, kind of a profile questionnaire. Okay, but thank that you. That's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
platforms and, and tools. But if a teacher ha has uh, uh, 30 students, the relationship between can be one to one. But if uh, a teacher has 100 students, 200 students, 400 uh, students, like as uh, my case, uh, the relationship one to one, it's, uh, it's impossible. It's impossible. We need uh, to support uh, the, uh, to the platforms that uh, produce data <coughs> about the learning activities uh, on the courts. Okay. Uh, two years ago, we uh, installed an uh, open edX instance in the University of Cauca. We call it uh, Selene. Selene is a Greek uh, name uh, of the of the moon. And we started to work in MOOC movement, MOOC techniques, but with, with Spock, with uh, some courses. Uh, daily astronomy, uh, comprehension and argumentative text, uh, editor latex, and uh, introduction to the drones. In this course, uh, can subscribe any 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 student in the university, and the course has a uh, uh, valued are two credit academics. Uh, the credit academics are. Uh, uh, 98 uh, hours to the to the semester. For example, in my case, in my case, this is my son, astronomy daily. We have uh, four four hundred students, uh, but we have a problem. In we work really with uh, limited resources. We don't have and uh, identify recognition system. We um, we found in the in the in the student yes uh, yes uh, we um, sorry the system is uh, based uh, in a good faith of the of the students when their work in the platform. Yes, uh, but obvious, this does not uh, prevent trumps, but uh, we in the, uh, do the work, do future work to resolve these problems around the identified uh, recognition. Mm, how works in this course? Um, this course has a, a, a theme for a week, a different theme for a week. Each theme has forum discussion, has a, an assessment, and uh, other activities like uh, to access uh, several res uh, web resources, videos, uh, simulators, practice, uh, lectures, and um, like a teacher uh, need, uh, need to know if uh, these activities, those activities are uh, development to the, to the student, see? In our case, our instant and open edX uh, don't prefer this, this data. Uh, we work mm, with uh, several tools uh, of learning analytics according to the literacy, for example, inside, for example, analyzed, but 
we didn't uh, work with these uh, platforms because they don't respond to specific requirements uh, to the teachers, uh, to the course. In this case, we need to um, propose a uh, system indicators to um, to 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 uh, to see the activity in the in the in the in the open edX around the learning activities on the on the student. Uh, there are in first time and specific indicators interaction for example student with the with the platform to access for example for example to interaction with the contents to access to video to extend to access uh, to to simulators etc interaction with the communication tools forum discussion for example and uh, interaction with the system evaluation in our pedagogical model in online uh, environment course, we need this uh, information to evaluate, to obtain an evaluation of the students. Uh, with, this, with this information, we can uh, compound other indicators, median, constancy, progress, deception. <coughs> okay. Uh, this is uh, a basic archi archi architecture about uh, the solution. Uh, we take information of a uh, file tracking log on open edX and um, with uh, this information work uh, uh, through uh, a model of uh, monitoring that process the information and uh, through the web application the process can consult uh, the information about learning activities on uh, a group of students in particular. And uh, can, can see the, the specific indicator or component indicators. The tool uh, uh, show two uh, automatic uh, reports, for example, about the, to the access to the, to the courts, uh, to the evaluation, and we can see correla correlation uh, into, uh, between uh, this uh, information, and we can uh, know uh, to the, the behavior of the students around the course. It's important for us uh, to improve the design the course of the design the uh, activities. Conclusions, for us, mm, an institution of the higher education, uh, traditional education, the uh, moment MOOC is important uh, because uh, through, through this can uh, improve our offered uh, academic, but, uh, Topics, for example, feedback, evaluation, and uh, follow-up are difficult in environment of the massivity. Tools like uh, this paper show uh, are important to the teacher because it show information that uh, teachers need needs to, for example, evalu evaluate the learning and, uh, and, and students, but uh, improve, improve to uh, the design of the, of the course on learning, learning course. E, um, our idea is uh, uh, to do work uh, about improve this tool to offer uh, not only one group, one small group of teachers uh, in, in my university, you know, 
or all teachers, maybe, in uh, our university. I want to acknowledge uh, Erasmus Plus and uh, Proyecto Modmaker and Colciencias in Colombia that facilitate uh, this presentation here. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Mario, some questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mario. The last presentation will be made by Galina Mozaeva from National Research Tom's State University from Russia. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Galina Mazeva. I am from Tomsk State University, uh, from Siberia, Russia. Uh, at the first, uh, I want to say that, um, unfortunately, my English is not so good. And uh, excuse me for um, my speech, and I will um, use my paper. Uh, some words uh, about uh, my university, uh, it uh, uh, was founded uh, in, in uh, 1878. Uh, it uh, is uh, one of the oldest Russian university, and uh, it was the first uh, in Siberia and forest. And uh, now uh, it is one of the 21 leading Russian university, and uh, we go to ranking, <laughs> we go to world. <laughs> and we study English. Uh, near 15,000 students now in our un in, uh, university, uh, and uh, it's a classical university with differences, uh, different um, directions. Uh, now about uh, MOOCs. We started uh, making MOOCs in uh, 2014. Now, uh, learners can study on uh, 35 hour courses in Russian and English uh, on uh, four platforms, uh, Coursera at first and three um, Russian, uh, different Russian platforms. Uh, there are results of our work in uh, MOOCs. Um, now about uh, quality. Um, we are working not only uh, on the quantity, but on the quality of MOOCs. Unfortunately, uh, the quality of online courses is often uh, substituted with their success. The MOOC quality uh, or their success is measured with the number of uh, enrollments, number of um, um, completes and uh, certificates. Uh, but um, we see that uh, these criteria are not perfect. There are at least uh, two uh, major uh, types of courses, a popular science course and a specialized uh, professional course, courses. Uh, if we uh, measure two courses of, of different types, uh, none of them gets uh, the maximum score. That is shown on this slide. Uh, popular science course more, has uh, more enrollments, but uh, um, uh, less uh, completers and certificate, certificates, um, etc. Um, Mm -hmm. um, our university designs, designed a system for more quality evaluation. It includes uh, several stages and uh, six groups of uh, st stakeholders. Uh, let me comment uh, on uh, quality assessment of every stage of the course production. The first step is the request for MOOC proposals. Uh, that is. Um, now, 
That is how we select MOOCs which are going to be pro produced on the university grants. Uh, usually we um, give uh, from uh, 15 to, uh, from 10 to 15 grants uh, to our um, uh, access. Um, at this stage, the university administration um, assess the cost potential for university promotion and possible uh, recover value. Uh, the cost team, uh, um, the cost, uh, the cost team uh, <coughs> assess the cost uh, uh, features uh, and uh, assess charisma uh, from the point of view uh, of the MOOC format. The educational program supervisor uh, guarantees uh, that the course meets uh, high standards of teaching the subject and may be integrated into educational programs in the framework of, of uh, blended learning. The platform representatives uh, provide focus about the course possible <coughs> demand. Um, Uh, the next stage is the course design and production. Um, here we invite the platform, the course team and the beta testers for evaluation of uh, the course materials. Then the platform, the team and the access uh, of the course analyze the course quality on the learning process. On completing uh, the course, we get data that characterize uh, learners' success. Uh, we uh, see uh, the types of differences as soon as we start working on the course. These differences influence uh, the course promotion, its focus and its support on the platform after it, um, after, uh, it is uh, started. Um, you can see uh, these differences on this uh, slide. Um, feedback is uh, significant, significant uh, in quality evaluation. We set the question, do learners evaluate the quality of popular science and uh, specialized MOOC differently? To answer this question, we have analyzed the results of the final uh, optional questionnaire that course, uh, course uh, completes on 19 our MOOCs um, filled in. Then uh, there are uh, 1,499 uh, survey participants, uh, that is 50% um, of all um, our MOOCs uh, completed at the moment of study, that uh, it, it was uh, this spring. Uh, we have analyzed only three, three um, questions um, from this questionnaire, but came up uh, with interesting results. Uh, these questions um, are, the first, what are the most helpful course elements for you? The second, are you uh, satisfied with the depth of the course content? And uh, third, uh, how do you value the assess com uh, competence in the subject? Average uh, scores in popular science and specialized uh, courses um, show that learners uh, indeed assess uh, their quality differently. Learners uh, of the popular science course, uh, courses uh, value their video lectures as more as a segment as less, um, as less useful. Then uh, their colleagues um, studying um, uh, specialized courses. At the same time, uh, the first group will more satisfied with the depth of the course content and the level of the uh, access uh, competence. Uh, these results uh, are important for, uh, for as design courses and uh, for uh, improving their quality. Um, uh, that is interesting. 
Uh, one and the same course offered uh, by our university on different platforms is um, assess assessed uh, differently. We suppose that it is due to different uh, objectives uh, that uh, diverse platform use. Uh, users. One of them aim uh, at professional training, others at learning uh, sometimes new. But um, unfortunately, um, uh, some, uh, sometime um, the team of production, uh, of MOOCs production, um, um, uh, try to create a course for all uh, learners uh, without uh, differentiation. Uh, our experience in MOOC production uh, and analyze, uh, um, analyzing allows us to the state uh, to um, make some um, uh, conclusions uh, which uh, you can see on this um, slide. I uh, can um, mark your um, uh, attention uh, for uh, two from them. The first, uh, the first is um, exp uh, expertise uh, should be uh, enhanced, uh, should be enhanced, not only design of the future course, but um, appraised MOOCs as well need uh, profound expertise. And the second um, conclusion, um, the main conclusion, is um, uh, differences between courses of different types need to be taken into consideration during pro as production as uh, uh, quality evaluation. The quality evaluation system, uh, for that reason, cannot be uh, unified. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was very difficult for me, <laughs> but I, I tried. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. Uh, Questions? I will try to answer uh, <laughs> your questions, but um, there are my colleagues uh, from Moscow who uh, are ready to help me. <laughs> Please. No. Thank you very much. Okay.